Yes, friends, I'm here with a new tutorial. In this tutorial, we will try to teach you the fundamental components you need to learn about microservices. To help you understand what topics are included in this tutorial and to ensure you get the most out of it, I'd like to briefly explain what you'll be learning. Of course, I can't explain everything here, but you'll basically be able to get an idea of what it's going to be like. Now, the first thing I actually want is for people to have a basic understanding of a structure. In other words, doing things step by step without knowing the whole picture can get a bit boring, and constantly working on simple things and coding without seeing a project as a whole really makes people lose interest in tutorials. That's why we'll be working on a project here. We're going to write a microservices project, and I'll be explaining to you the fundamental topics you need to learn within it. The topics I'll be covering here are as follows. Spring Boot Training, Spring Cloud Training. Together, we'll also be deploying these on Kubernetes and Google Cloud, friends. So, we'll all start a project from scratch together. It will be a microservices framework, with microservices organized as modules inside. The configurations of these microservices, the config server, and the config server will pull the basic config information from GitHub, and based on this, our out service and user service will fetch the necessary application information from the config server when they first start up. Each microservice will have its own database. In the out service, there will be a relational database, and in the user service, there will be a NoSQL database, friends. This is how we will set up the system. All the microservices we have created and written will be deployed into a Kubernetes cluster on Google Cloud, friends. I will explain all of these one by one. How is it done? How does it work? How do you create a Docker image? I will be showing each step of pushing to Docker Hub and deploying these on the Kubernetes cluster one by one. We will also be building the system you see on this screen during this course, friends. In other words, we will make a system published on Google Cloud accessible to users over the internet. This is the kind of system we will be creating, friends. This is the main goal of our course. In this way, I will be teaching you microservices, friends. Apart from this, what else is there on the microservices side? So, what exactly is a microservice, sir, if you were to ask that? Microservices are actually structures created to address the performance losses that arise from the vertical scaling of applications written under a single project in a monolithic architecture. You can actually think of this as an approach as well. Of course, over time, the architecture and, along with it, the add-ons have developed a lot in parallel with this. Today, the Docker containers you use, Kubernetes orchestration tools, and similar technologies have actually evolved over time as the microservice architecture has spread. However, when it comes to microservices, it's actually about managing a monolithic application by breaking it down into small modules. So, we can briefly explain microservices like this. Here, what we call each microservice in terms of coding is actually small modular structures, in other words, we could call them mini-monoliths or monoliths. Each microservice contains the code related to its own domain, and as long as it remains independent from the outside, it performs its required tasks within its own internal structure using its own database. For example, in our application, there will be an auth microservice. The sole responsibility of the auth microservice is this, handling user registration and login processes, friends. It will take care of these. In our user microservice, we will have structures like users' basic information and updating their own details. Here too, for example, in our application, MongoDB will operate with its own dedicated database. This is basically how the core system works here. So, you create small monoliths and ensure that these monoliths can communicate with each other when necessary. Of course, when the system is broken down like this, different approaches come into play to make it run more efficiently. Those are a bit outside the scope of our topic. First, let's complete the first step, 
There will be additional training on this later on. So, what does a microservice architecture look like? Or, what kind of things might we encounter when we deploy it to the cloud? I want to show those a bit more. I can give you examples from designs I've made before. These are sample designs I use in my trainings, friends. For example, we have a structure like this. We have a training content, a microservice. Here, we have the out microservice, user main, and elastic microservice. Here, we have our config servers. These are connected to a cluster IP within an internal network. Through this cluster IP, other microservices pull their related configurations. There is also Elasticsearch and Redis in the environment. Besides that, databases like MongoDB and PostgreSQL are also part of this setup, friends. The structure you see here is a system set up on Amazon, specifically on Amazon Kubernetes. Here, you can see the code belonging to our microservice. These are the codes, these are just given as examples. There could be more or fewer. Depending on the need, these structures can scale up or down both with pod autoscaling and node autoscaling logic. In front of these, there are always cluster IPs, friends. Because there will be a lot of pods, you can't keep track of the IPs of these codes yourself. That's why you need a structure that works with a load balancer logic to distribute the workload here. That's handled by our internal cluster IPs here, inside the Kubernetes cluster. Apart from that, these microservices can communicate with each other through the client. Or, there might be a queue service in the environment, like RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, or Apache Kafka. Here, it doesn't matter if it's Apache Kafka or RabbitMQ, microservices communicate with each other through any queue service, friends, Besides that, in front of the system, in other words, in front of this whole ecosystem, there is a gateway, friends. So, what does this gateway do? By managing the endpoints, it actually knows which microservices incoming requests should be routed to. Additionally, if there's any issue with the microservices, or if the microservices are inaccessible, it can bypass them. It can directly indicate that there is no access to them. So, if you want to open access to the system from a single point, and if you want to put security here, or in front of or behind it, the gateway is a structure you can manage, friends. This is generally what I prefer. If I'm using a cloud system, I use that cloud system's own gateway, friends. Because there, you can automatically integrate and monitor structures like WAF. Otherwise, you have to write it yourself. I mean, there is Spring Cloud Gateway available. You know, you can write that. You can implement Spring Gateway, but then you have to manage it yourself. Doing this might be a bit complicated for you. Other than that, we also open up to the outside through the gateway, friends. Whoever is going to access it on the internet, whether it's third-party software, our own software, mobile applications, or web applications, they can access our application through the cloud. Now, let me give you another piece of information about the cloud. Again, let's say you have a microservice architecture like this in your microservice setup. And within this microservice architecture, I want to explain how certain parameters are stored, how a more secure structure is established, and how the system operates. Normally, your microservices are here. In front of these microservices, there might be load balancers or cluster IPs depending on how you use them. Now, let's say we have our microservices running on an Amazon server. Here, it doesn't matter whether you use multiple load balancers or just one. You open an endpoint here, however you want to operate. In other words, external access. But this external access isn't set up so that it can be reached directly from outside. Instead, you create a structure within your own VPC where only the gateway can provide access. This way, there's absolutely no way to access your microservices or load balancers from outside. Since it's only a VPC, you can access it via VPN. Other than that, 
An API gateway is defined, my preferred setup is to use an API gateway on Amazon. I'll connect the API gateway to these load balancers and route external traffic through it, friends. That's how I design the system. Here, for a bit more security, you can use Cloudflare. The main thing you need to do here is connect a domain name to Cloudflare, and to allow Cloudflare to access the DNS, you define Amazon's own DNS records and match them accordingly. You need to know a bit about this process. In other words, you need some technical knowledge on the Amazon side, but it's not too difficult to connect it. So what are you doing in this system? Cloudflare can handle a lot of things for you, like caching mechanisms and blocking DDoS attacks. The free version is pretty sufficient for most needs, but if you want to work more professionally, I recommend getting a paid version. By integrating it this way, you ensure that access to your system is only through Cloudflare. For example, even if someone knows the endpoints of your API gateway, the request will be immediately rejected. Because what you're actually doing here is cross-origin. In other words, you don't accept any requests that don't come through Cloudflare. This way, all requests actually come through Cloudflare. This also means that if there's a bot, a bot attack, or a DDoS attack, it minimizes them as much as possible. We do the same thing for the API gateway as well, folks. If you enable the WAF on the API gateway, it also effectively blocks attacks, friends. This way, it ensures that your system stays as secure as possible. Apart from that, I wrote down some parameters here so you can understand a bit better how to make the system more secure. There are a lot of things we use, friends. For example, there's MongoDB, Redis, RabbitMQ, PostgreSQL, Zipkin. I'm talking about any application you can think of. So I'm talking about containers. Now, these containers are producing data while they are running, friends. While some of the data they produce is not very important, some are very important. For example, we are databases. Now you have to protect the information of the databases, friends. For this, what we generally use within the Kubernetes structure is volumes. We define volumes, then we connect these volumes, for example for Amazon, to Amazon S3 bucket. In this way, all the data in the codes in the system are backed up to volumes, and the volumes are backed up to S3 bucket at regular intervals. Here you need to determine the backup according to your own needs. But I generally recommend backing up very important data more frequently, like every three hours. This is entirely related to your setup. Depending on how you store your data and how important your data is, you can do this more frequently. This way, you can also perform backups. So, on the cloud side, there are many technologies and many structures that can be used in this way for microservices, friends. I wanted to briefly explain some of these to you. Detailed trainings about these will be coming one by one. For now, the first step we consider important is, of course, the microservice architecture. Creating this and being able to run it on any Kubernetes cluster. In this training, we will be setting up the structure you see here, friends.